After decades of slavery, black people finally got their human status back when slavery was abolished. However, this was the start of another era of brutality and structural racism aimed at making black people poor and weak. They were sidelined and marginalized, given only second and third class citizen rights. Housing segregation forced black people to live in separated black communities away from the white population. Segregation in every matter of life was seen, and that's why segregated schools, swimming pools, restaurants, playing areas, and even churches were built. White people thought that all this would make black people extinct. However, the opposite happened, and the black community rose as one of the thriving communities in the United States. Their land ownership and wealth increased exponentially. That's when the racist white people and institutions of the United States made full-scale efforts to rob black people of their lands and wealth. The generational wealth black people had accumulated was confiscated, and that's why black people have far less wealth than white population. But how was this done so subtly yet systemically? Let's find that out in this video. In the early 20th century, African Americans possessed a significant 14 million acres of land. But sadly, using tactics and structural racism, this was confiscated. People were made to believe that this robbing was actually legal and necessary. Well, it was essential for only white supremacists who wanted to prosper over the wealth and lands of the black people. Recent reports estimate that only the land robbed from black people in the 20th century is equal to $326 billion. Don't forget, we are talking only about land, not the raw wealth and other resources black people were deprived of. As we entered the 21st century, a staggering 90% of the 14 million acres of land had been unjustly taken from them. Today, African Americans hold a mere 1.1 million acres of farmland and they have partial ownership of an additional 1.07 million acres. Throughout the century, white farmers and landowners devised various methods to dispossess African Americans of their land. These methods included acts of violence, complications related to heirs' property, tax sales, and the implementation of the Torrens Acts. Remarkably, the heirs' Property Act, one of these methods remains in effect to this day. Consequently, black landowners have consistently lost the wealth they painstakingly accumulated over generations. But to truly understand how this worked, you have to know about the extreme measures employed by those who wrongfully seized land from African American landowners. Both laws and practices enabled white landowners, farmers, and developers to manipulate the system and gain control over land owned by African American farmers and homeowners. Following the Civil War, a significant number of black Americans became landowners when the government allocated roughly 20 million acres, primarily in the South, under the Homestead Act. These land holdings could have served as a foundation for the accumulation of black wealth in post-Jim Crow America. However, they were instead a source of enrichment for others, exacerbating the racial wealth gap rather than ameliorating it. It's because white individuals and officials employed four extreme measures to seize and claim land owned by black Americans. The first one was violence. As black Americans grew wealthier and acquired more property, jealousy among white individuals intensified. They turned to violence and death deadly force to uphold the notion of white supremacy. Organizations like the Tuskegee Institute and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People documented over 3,000 lynchings between 1865 and 1965. Many of these victims were black landowners, and the objective was to eradicate black wealth, confiscate black land, and perpetuate white supremacy. In combination with violence, white supremacists used law as well. The notorious Heirs Property Act refers to land passed down through generations without a clear and legally recorded title. This made it easier for evil white individuals to exploit legal loopholes and gain control of land owned by African-American families. To make it more effective, additional property tax was imposed on African-Americans who frequently lost their land due to tax sales. Many were unable to pay property taxes, leading to the auctioning of their land. Developers often took advantage of these auctions to acquire land that families did not wish to sell. What's more, the Torrance Acts were used to undermine the land ownership rights of black Americans. These laws aimed to simplify land titles, but in practice, they often resulted in the loss of land by African-American property owners. To fully comprehend the extent of these injustices, you have to know how these four methods were used in the entire U.S. In Birmingham, Kentucky in the early 20th century, the town had a predominantly black population and was a center for tobacco production. However, it fell victim to violence and land seizures. One night in 1908, armed white individuals, known as Night Riders, terrorized the town resulting in the deaths of several black residents. Property records reveal that 14 black landowners lost over 60 acres of farmland and 21 city lots to white individuals, often at share of sales for paltry prices. In Pierce City, Missouri, yet another horrifying incident unfolded on August 18, 1901. 1,000 armed white individuals set fire to five houses owned by black residents and tragically killed four black individuals. In the aftermath of this brutal attack, all 129 black residents of the town made the difficult decision to flee, never to return. Shockingly, it was reported by the Associated Press that nine Pierce City black citizens lost a total of 30 acres of farmland and 10 city lots. These properties were later purchased by white individuals at deeply discounted prices.
Texas, Eveline Brinson, whose home was among those burned by the mob, eventually sold her lot for a mere $25 to a white woman after the harrowing attack. Black people were literally giving away their lands to avoid getting lynched. However, Later, it was said that black people sold their land at their own will. Lynchings and mob attacks targeting black individuals were frequently followed by a mass evacuation of black citizens, many of whom were forced into abandoning their properties or selling them at unfairly low prices. These black landowners found themselves under immense pressure, both from authorities and others, to vacate their land and leave. They became refugees in their own country. As an example, the Associated Press investigation revealed that in 1920, following an election day attack on the black community in Ocoee, Florida, 18 black families lost a total of 330 acres of land and 48 city lots as they fled the area. Hightower parted with 52 acres for a mere $10 in 1926. Remarkably, the land lost by these 18 Okoe families, excluding any buildings currently on it, is now estimated to be worth over $4.2 million. Sometimes, individual black farmers were specifically targeted and attacked by groups of white farmers known as the White Caps. These groups operated in several southern and border states around the turn of the 20th century to drive black landowners from their property and discourage other black individuals from acquiring land. The White Caps often attached notes with crudely drawn coffins to the doors of black landowners, warning them to leave or face dear consequences. One such case involved Ely Hilson of Lincoln County, Mississippi, who received a warning on November 18, 1903. A month later, despite ignoring the warning, the 39-year-old farmer was tragically shot deed as he drove his buggy toward his farm. His horse returned home with his leafless body, delivering the grim news to his wife, Hannah. She struggled to raise their 11 children and manage the 74-acre farm without her husband. Eventually, she lost the property through mortgage foreclosure in 1905. Land records indicate that the farm was sold for over $400 to S.P. Oliver, a county supervisor. Today, the property is worth tens of millions of dollars. However, However, it wasn't solely the actions of the white caps and night riders that forced black individuals from their land. Sometimes, it was officials who played a role. In Yazoo County, Mississippi, Norman Stevens and his twin brother Homer operated a trucking business transporting cotton pickers to plantations. Rosie Fields, Stevens' widow, would later reveal a harrowing story. In 1950, a white farmer demanded immediate delivery of workers to his field, but Stevens had prior commitments and promised to drop off the laborers later. In response, the farmer summoned the sheriff. That evening, the Stevens brothers found themselves locked in a second-floor room at the county jail. Fearing for their lives, they managed to escape through a window, leap to the ground, and ran. Rosie Fields recounted that her husband had overheard heard the sheriff discussing where to hide their bodies. After this narrow escape, the Stevens brothers quickly flagged down a bus headed to Ohio. A year later, Rosie Fields and her five children joined them. For a decade, the family diligently made mortgage and property tax payments on the house they had left behind, as documented in records. However, the financial strain became overwhelming, and they never dared to return. In the 1960s, they ceased making payments and ultimately lost the house they had purchased for $700 in 1942. In Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. The tragic tale of Anthony Crawford stands out as one of the most horrifying incidents of racial violence leading to the loss of land owned by African Americans. Anthony Crawford, a prosperous African American, inherited arable land upon his father's passing. Over the years, he expanded his land holdings significantly through substantial purchases made in 1883, 1888, 1899, and 1903. During the mid to late 1890s, Crawford played a pivotal role as a co-founder of the Industrial Union of Abbeville County. This organization was dedicated to advancing the material, moral, and intellectual well-being of colored people. Crawford was not only a prominent figure in his community, but also a father to 12 sons and four daughters, making him one of the wealthiest individuals in Abbeville County. However, Crawford's success became a source of unwanted attention, posing a threat to the prevailing white supremacy of the era. There existed unwritten but clearly defined limits or boundaries that African Americans were not allowed to exceed. For many decades, successful black individuals lived under the constant shadow of fear, knowing that their white neighbors could, at any moment, resort to violence and strip them of everything they had diligently achieved. Regrettably, that dreadful day arrived for Anthony Crawford on October 21, 1916. Crawford was en route to Abbeville, transporting two loads of cotton and a load of seed when he got caught in a dispute with W.D. Barksdale, a white store owner, over the price of cotton seed. Crawford did not know it was pre-planned. Barksdale offered Crawford 85 cents a pound for his cotton seed, to which Crawford responded that he had a better offer. In response, Barksdale hurled accusations at Crawford, calling him a liar, while Crawford labeled Barksdale a cheat. Three clerks in the store promptly seized axe handles, and Crawford retreated into the street. Sheriff Burt's intervened, arresting Crawford for using offensive language towards a white man. Crawford was briefly confined in jail and released later that day after posting bail amounting to $1.15. Meanwhile, as Crawford sought to secure his release on bail, Barksdale was assembling a mob with the intent of punishing Crawford and, if possible, 
correcting what they perceived as his disrespectful behavior. Although Sheriff Burtz allowed Crawford to exit through a side door, the mob caught sight of him and chased him into a nearby cotton mill. Inside the mill, Crawford sought refuge in the boiler room. McKinney Can, a member of the mob, followed Crawford into the boiler room. In an act of self-defense, Crawford grabbed a hammer from nearby tools and struck Can, rendering him unconscious. Despite the efforts of mill workers to intervene, Crawford was subjected to a brutal assault by the mob. Sheriff Burtz returned to the scene and arrested Crawford once more, much to the displeasure of the white mob. To secure Crawford away from the mob, the sheriff had to make a promise to Can's brothers. The promise was that Crawford would not be secretly removed from town before the full extent of Can's injuries could be assessed. Ultimately, Can's injuries were found not to be grave, but Crawford's condition was dire. He received medical attention from Dr. C.C. Gamble, who also held the position of mayor in Abbeville. Dr. Gamble grimly declared that Crawford was unlikely to survive his injuries, fearing that Crawford might succumb before they could exact their own form of justice, and worried that the sheriff might attempt to spirit him away from town. Approximately 200 white men laid siege to the jail around 3 p.m. They captured Sheriff Burtz and disarmed him, forcibly abducting Crawford. Crawford was dragged down three flights of stairs during the cheers of the bloodthirsty mob. They subjected him to a merciless beating with rocks, wagon boards, and their bare fists, even going so far as to spit on him. The mob then paraded Crawford through the black section of town with a noose around his neck, serving as a chilling warning to others. By this point, Crawford was likely lifeless, but the mob continued to subject his lifeless body to further savagery. They hanged him from a tree and unleashed a barrage of bullets. The mob's actions were driven by their deep-seated resentment of Crawford's wealth. The newspaper headlines the following day were shockingly callous, reading, Negro strung up and shot to pieces. In an attempt to conceal the horrifying truth, the county coroner reported that Crawford had met his end at the hands of unknown parties. That that night, the relentless mob decided to forcibly expel Crawford's children and their families from the area, perpetuating the reign of terror that had gripped the community. On October 23, 1916, the white residents of Abbeville, which included many who had been part of the lynching mob, held a vote to expel the remaining members of the Crawford family from South Carolina. They also resolved to confiscate the family's significant property holdings. Additionally, they decided to close down all black-owned businesses in Abbeville. The Crawfords requested that they be given until November 15th to vacate, and this request was granted. As a result, they left, leaving behind their family's assets that had been passed down through generations. When violence could not work against black people, legal hurdles like taxation were created. Tax sales provided a means to take land from its rightful owners and put it up for auction. White tax assessors frequently inflated the assessed value of black-owned land, imposing an unfairly heavy tax burden on black property owners. This practice gradually eroded the income of these families. In cases where black-owned property appreciated in value, or when a black property owner challenged white supremacy, local authorities could simply declare the property property tax delinquent and auction it off. In such situations, black property owners often preferred to retain their land rather than sell it. However, many of them had fixed incomes, making it increasingly challenging to cover their annual property taxes. Once they failed to pay, the county would place their property up for auction. Developers exploited this situation when they sought access to land that families were reluctant to sell. The story of Evelina Jenkins, a native of the South Carolina Sea Islands, serves as a poignant example. She owned numerous acres of land, including an entire island, during the early 1970s when property value along the state's coastline were skyrocketing. Unfortunately, due to the state's inadequate investment in schools for people of color, Miss Jenkins received minimal education and never learned to read. Decades of disfranchisement and white control over local government and the courts had instilled in her the belief that any rights and protections these institutions offered did not apply to her. Even entering local government offices, where people registered for licenses or paid their taxes, meant inviting mistreatment and humiliation, something she sought to avoid. Miss Jenkins entrusted a white neighbor who had befriended her with the task of delivering her annual property tax payments to town on her behalf. However, instead of submitting these payments, the neighbor pocketed them. He waited for Miss Jenkins's taxes to become delinquent, at which point he purchased the lien to her property at the county's annual tax auction. After the statutory redemption period had passed, he gained full ownership of her land holdings, including the island. Subsequently, he sold the property to a developer. In the decades that followed, the land once owned by Miss Jenkins generated substantial wealth. Houses on the island she had once owned now sell for well over $400,000. Tragically, Miss Jenkins never benefited from this prosperity. Rather than leaving her children with a substantial inheritance, she passed away penniless, compelled to spend her final days in her daughter's mobile home. While Miss Jenkins's case was exceptionally appealing, the legal appropriation of black-owned land through similar means was not uncommon in thriving real 
real estate markets like Hilton Head and the surrounding sea islands. Tax sales offered investors a lucrative opportunity to acquire valuable property at a fraction of its true value. Another method used to rob black people of their land was the Torrin Act. This system was first developed in Australia in 1858 by Sir Robert Torrens. This system aimed to strengthen the certainty of land ownership and simplify land transactions. When introduced in the United States, the Torrens Act was intended to streamline the process of registering property titles. However, it created a loophole that allowed third parties to forcibly dispossess families of their property through partition sales. Partition sales come into play when one property owner desires to sell, but others do not agree. Under the Torrance Act and related regulations, these sales could occur without notifying other family members or co-owners of the land. Once the sale occurred, the rules associated with the Torrance Act protected the buyer from any legal challenges by owners who were either unaware of the sale or had not consented to it. Another method was the Heirs' Property Act, which typically refers to family-owned land that has been passed down through multiple generations without undergoing the formal legal procedures required to establish ownership conclusively. In the absence of proper proceedings upon an owner's death, heirs may possess the property, but they lack the clear legal title necessary to definitively prove ownership. This limitation meant they might find themselves unable to sell the property or use it as collateral for loans. It also exposed them to a higher risk of losing the property through a partition action or due to failure to pay property taxes. Over generations, the number of co-owners of heirs' property often grew substantially. This posed challenges for landowners, particularly when not every family member could be located to seek permission to sell the land. Consequently, even if some family members wished to retain the land, others could choose to sell it. White developers frequently capitalized on family miscommunication to seize control of the land. These partition sales frequently resulted in the land being sold for a fraction of its actual market value, benefiting the buyer while leaving displaced family members with nothing. Speculators exploited this legal maneuver to compel the sale of millions of acres of black-owned land over several decades. Only in recent years have some states begun to adopt uniform laws aimed at curbing the most predatory abuses of the heirs' property laws. What do you think? What if the lands and wealth of black people were not robbed? Isn't it true that we would see a black ruling and elite class in the United States? Let us know what you think should be done to make compensation for what was done to the black people. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about the black culture civilization history and evidence about how glorious blacks have been thanks for watching and until the next video stay tuned